Vinyl Night, powered by Entertalk Radio, the groove of the music industry. I'm your host, John Robinson, coming to you live from Vinyl Night Studios in beautiful and hot Thousand Oaks, California. This show features some of the best and most influential people in the music industry. Each week, we will feature an intimate, candid, and in-depth one-on-one with all the musicians, recording engineers, singers, and producers that have changed the world. Before we get started, I'd like to give a big thanks out to my sponsors, DW Drums, Peisty Cymbals, Remo Drumheads, Regal Tip, Drumsticks and Brushes, Blue Microphones, Zoom Cameras, LP Percussion, Roland, Oralex, and Source Connect Pro. You can also download our InterTalk Radio app on your iPhone and Android when you're on the road. Born in Los Angeles, Russ Tottenham grew up in the hot 50s musical environment and quickly made contacts which would aid him throughout his long career. The most important of these was Phil Spector. After making his debut as a guitarist on the Paris Sisters' Be My Boy in 61, Tadema became a full-time member of the Spectres Three vocal trio. After graduating from Fairfax High School, Rock and Roll High School, Russ studied drama at L.A. City College. He returned to the music industry with his friends and recorded a song called Just a Little Touch of Your Love. Songwriter Barry Mann took Russ to New York, where he wrote songs for the Cinderella's, the Chiffons, Leslie Gore, and Brian Wilson. He also arranged for the great Carol King. In 1964, he joined the television show Shindig and the house band, at which time he also appeared with the Righteous Brothers and Phil Oaks Sessions. Moving into film work, he collaborated with the great Jack Nitschke on Village of the Giants and Candy before recording Memo from Turner with Ry Cooper, Cooter, and uh, Randy Newman for the Mick Jagger film. That soundtrack started Tideman's 25-year association with Warner Brothers Records. Through his friendship with Lowell George, he produced the first Little Feet debut album, but he did not become a full staff member of Warner's until 1971. He became a friend and producer to Randy Newman and through the 70s worked on projects with James Taylor, Graham Central Station, Ricky Lee Jones, and George, George Harrison, to name a few. In the early 80s, he produced Stompin' at the Savoy for Rufus and Shaka Khan and produced Paul Simon's Hearts and Bones. He also produced Steve Winwood's Back in the High Life album, possibly Winwood's best work. His work with the jazz and R&B artists is paired him with George Benson, Dave Sanborn, and Patty Austin. From 89 to 94, he worked with the great Eric Clapton's Journeyman, 24 Nights, Unplugged, and From the Cradle. He's won numerous gold and platinum albums and singles, tech awards, Grammy nominations, and three Grammy awards. Higher Love for Steve Winwood, Tears in Heaven, Rush, and Unplugged for Eric Clapton. Russ is a member of the Jazz Foundation of America, the Tibet House Annual Concert Committee, and the Friars Club. Ladies and gentlemen, my producer extraordinaire, Russ Tideman. Welcome to Vinyl Night, Russ. Thanks, John. It's great, great to do this with you. Um, Man, it's... Yeah, you know, I always thought it was pasty, not pasty, so, but it's a little like a burlesque show, so you can't say that. Well, you can actually, and and you could use them that way if you if you wanted to, I, I guess. But no, it's 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 feisty. <laughs> Man, it's uh, I, I you know, like I do with all my guests, I um I I I, I want to find out um what got them into this level and how how they started, and you know, your your mom and dad were they musical? They they were not musical. I mean, my mother could read and play piano. Uh, you know, she we had the fireside folk song book, which all the all the good lefties had, and so right. we'd sit around the piano and, and, and she would play and we'd sing. Um, but they had the best taste in music. You know, they moved out to L.A. in the late '30s, so they used to go see Nat King Cole at a bowling alley on Vine Street. <clears throat> so wow. we had. We had Nat Cole Trio Records in the house, Louis Armstrong, Louis and Ella, uh, um, uh, the, the Weavers and Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger, um, you know, Beethoven. My father's favorite piece of classical music was the, the Emperor Concerto, uh, the Fifth Piano Concerto of, of mm-hmm. Beethoven. And th- we had a beautiful recording of, of uh, Arthur, Arthur Rubinstein playing that. And so, like, everything was in the house. And then... I have, you know, I have an older sister. So, in 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 1958, and, and you know, even 50, 55 and 56, two and a half years older, all those kids 
were listening to doo-wop records. So that's where I got the bug, you know. And, and in fact, I mean, the most important thing, I think, for me was listening to Lead Belly. We had Lead Belly records. And wow, yes. There was a sep- Man, I'm telling you, it's like from another planet, that stuff. And I was like three and heard uh, John Henry and on a Monday that was, you know, two sided 78. We had the, we had the album, you know, where there were like four or five records in a, in an album. And, but that I played that record over and over and over again. And Sonny Terry is on it. So there's this, you know, this sound of, of the, of the harmonica and high falsetto, and, and right. I can, I kind of remember what it felt like. I was thinking, what, where is this? What is this? You know, what sound is this? And why is it so raw and beautiful? And, and I, I took that record to, to, uh, to nursery school. Are you kidding me? Really? Other, to play for the other kids, like on share day. And that's like serious show and tell there, dude. <laughs> That's it, man. No lizards or rocks for me. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, you, you must have like, they must have looked at you like, whoa. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> well, so, all right. I mean, so th- this, you, this was embedded at such an early age to you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> did that, did that turn into... I mean, what was your first instrument? I mean, I know you play guitar, but did you yeah. start out on guitar? Uh, yeah, I mean, my, the first lessons I took were on guitar, but that was when I met Phil Spector. Um, right. And, you know, I idolized him, so I wanted to be Phil. And I took guitar lessons from his guitar teacher, which was across the street from Wallach's Music City, um, a guy named Burdell Mathis. And so, right. you know, I studied, and, and I wasn't a very great s- student, you know, but I learned to do certain things pretty well and and wound up then playing on some of Phil's singing on, and playing on a couple of Phil's demos. And then when he was working with the Paris sisters, he asked me to come in and I played. He made a whole album with them. But, you know, I, I just played rhythm parts and and arpeggio parts and 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 uh, and sang in the group. So that had to be like 1960, 61, I think. I don't know. But were I you singing? You um, yeah, right. Oh, it was a great tune. Were were, were you singing yeah. though before, like like in in grade school? Not not really. You know, uh, I I just I, I was immersed in doo-wop records, though. I loved them, the Moon Glows right. records, and and Shaboom by the Chords, and G by the Crows, wow. and and you know the Drifters. Well, they were uh, I think the Robins before they were the Drifters. You know, and right. you know there was a record called "Adorable" by the Colts. That's a beautiful record, and and uh, you, you know, and then the Liebern Stoller stuff, uh, uh, Smokey Joe's mm. Cafe, and Down in Mexico, and and all those crazy records. You know, and and Riot and Cell Block Number Nine, all those great, humorous, fantastic records. Um, so I that was it for me, you know. And then there were the more romantic ones that came along, you know, in, in the Still of the Night and the Flamingos records. I'll be home, and uh, right. you know those beautiful records. Uh, uh, I only have eyes for you, one of the greatest records. And of course, Why Do Fools Fall in Love, maybe the greatest of all the records ever made back then. Right, right. <clears throat> so yeah. were you were you like a an avid collector? Yes. Ooh. Yeah, I was. Do you, yeah. do, you, do you still do you still have those? <laughs> I I have I have uh, I have some vinyl, but um, I I'm very close to someone now who's a big record collector and a DJ, and and she has lots of like more stuff than you could imagine. I haven't even looked through it. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am so addicted to vinyl these days, you know, with the new, yeah. you know, the, the, the repressings and the 180 grams up, uh, you know, yeah. uh, LPs. Yeah. It's just, and, you know, I have a friend, it, it, I have a friend who, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. I have a friend who's a DJ here in New York and he, uh, I, I think he was at FUV and another rock and roll station, you know, a, a very famous station, which slips my mind now, like. A lot of other things, but anyway, his name is Paul Cavalcante, and he does 
he's a DJ on the classical station on the weekend. And he has a vinyl hour. And I swear to you, when he plays these vinyl records, you can hear it. Like the bottom, yeah. of it. it's beautiful sounding, you know? It's yes. really I, something. I, and I, yeah. I try to tell all the all the youth out there, you know, man, this is what got us into this. And uh, I think there's a huge turnaround now for vinyl. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely there is. Um, yeah, man, it's really amazing, you know. Hey, do you do you remember the first song, the first song you ever wrote? Uh, the first song I ever wrote. I, you know, it's hard for me to. I wrote a few songs all at once, and just a little touch of my love was one of them. Wow! And there were some others that, you know, uh, um, well. Yes, I guess so. That was, yeah, right. So that was, you know, and then I made a, like a demo of it and I took it to Lester Sill and he liked it and right. gave it to Lou Adler, who was working at, at uh, Donnie, working for Donnie Kirshner's publishing company upstairs in the same building. And Lou loved it and he sent it to Donnie and then I got signed as a writer there. So that was like 1963, I think. And then I went to New York. You know, Barry said, come to New York and, and we'll work together. So I did and wound up, you know, in a little cubicle at, at Screen Gems Columbia on Fifth Avenue and 55th. You know, go up there every day and, and bang out tunes. And Tony Wine was there. And, and so I I wrote with Cynthia Weil and we wrote, right. we wrote a couple of songs. Yeah, we wrote a couple of songs and we made these girls group records. Um, the Cinderella's records, and it was uh, Please Don't Wake Me and and um, Baby, Baby, I Still Love You. I'm partial oh, yeah. to Please Don't Wake Me. I'm partial to Please Don't Wake Me. And the, and the woman who sang that, uh, a girl at the time, was uh, Margaret Ross from The Cookies. And, and oh, then right, I met right. Jerry Goffin. Yeah. And and then I met Jerry Goffin, and Jerry and I wrote a bunch of songs together. And, and, and one of them was called I Never Dreamed. Uh, which came out as a Cookies record. It was like one of the last Cookies records, and Margaret sang the lead on that. But Carol King wrote the arrangement, so she did the horn arrangement and this little guitar line that's so beautiful and did the background vocals. Um, and Jerry and I produced produced that record, and the other the Cinderella's records are, are co-production with Barry Mann. Um, and Margaret Ross did a show at the Metropolitan, like a cabaret show at the Metropolitan Room a few, a few months ago. And she did those songs live. And Please Don't oh, Wake wow. Me, I, I couldn't believe it. It had never been done live, but the band was on it. It just it stopped the show. Like, they, you know, it just it was amazing to hear the thing. So anyway, I never dreamed to this day when I hear it, I think, well, I really haven't progressed that much since then. It's such a beautiful little record, you know. You know, when it's right, it's right, Russ. And, yeah. <clears throat> you know, that was right. That was right. Yeah. But, um, it wasn't so, a hit, so, but so um, what? <laughs> well, you know, maybe it can be recut. <laughs> yeah, you never know. But we wrote a song called Yes, I Will, which wound up on the first Monkeys album, but the Hollies also cut a version of it. And that was a, that right. was a hit in England. That was a big hit in England. And that was 65, I guess, you know. We wrote right. it in yeah, yeah. Do you um do you still have that um, Gibson L L twelve? I don't have the L twelve. That was my first guitar. I love that guitar. Dang. I don't know was, what you know. It may have gotten stolen or something. I think it was stolen. I don't know. That was a that's a badass axe, dude. That was really nice. It, yeah. It was a good. Guitar, and then I had the three thirty five. That's what I played on uh, on Shindig, and that got stolen. You, like a whole bunch of my guitars it, got stolen in in the early seventies. Oh 70s. my god! You know, yeah. I was <clears throat> for a lot of the listeners out there that didn't ever watch Shindig or too young. I used to watch that show religiously, and um, I was it was so cool. You know, it was kind of like that yeah. that entrance into this live rock and roll that we were we didn't ever get to see on television. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was produced by Jack Good, who came over from England. I think he was the producer of Ready, Steady, Go in England. And so he came over, 
It was his vision, black and white, fast cuts, you know, no, no nonsense, you know, and a, and a, and a guy who was the host, Jimmy O'Neill, who was a DJ, you know, so it was, it was kind of, even though it, it, it had a little sheen on it, it still was authentic stuff. And every, we'd pre-record those tracks, but all the vocals were always live. All the vocals oh, were live. Wow. Well, maybe the backgrounds got even pre-recorded often, but, um, but all the lead vocals were always live. And sometimes we'd play live on the show. We played behind Jackie Wilson and we played behind, uh, behind Jerry Lee Lewis. You will that. now be placed into the conference. And I think maybe work out with Jackie uh, was live. And, and there were others live. I can't really remember now. But most of the other stuff was pre-recorded tracks. How long did you do that gig for? About a year, almost a year, not quite. Wow. Yeah. And that is, I mean, it's so cool. It, it's, I still remember it, uh, you know, vividly. So it uh, definitely uh, had, had an impact on me. Yeah. And think about the band, you know, Leon Russell, Billy Preston, Larry right. Nectel, right. Jim Horn, Julius Wechter, wow. um, you know, all these cats. And Ray Pullman, who was one of the, one of the cutting, uh, one of the uh, the wrecking crew. Uh, he right. was my guitar teacher. That's how I got the gig. You know, uh, he called me in New York and he said, "Come home. We're doing television." So, you know, he put that band together. Wow, it's a, it's a brilliant idea. <clears throat> well, listen, yeah. uh, we're gonna, we're coming to our first break. Uh, we will be right back with the great Russ Tidal. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Hey, it's Tracy Smith and Beth Venus of Girls, Girls Talk Rock. Rock right here on the Inner Talk Radio Network. Every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Okay, Beth, they know that, but we want you to know that the industry pro's choice is Silver Tiger Production. STP is a full-service production agency offering sound, lighting, installations, talent buying, staffing, backline equipment, rental, and sales. Kapow! It's everything in the entertainment performance industry. It's all at... It's all that! SilverTigerProduction.com.
We are back with producer extraordinaire Russ Teitelman, and uh, we were talking about the uh, Shindig band when he came back from New York to uh, L.A., and then you met uh, uh, Jack uh, Nietzsche, right? In that time, I guess, 65, because I used to go to the studio and visit Phil. I used to go to Gold right. Star and, and hang around some of those sessions, and I played on a couple of them, not, you know, maybe two. Um, uh, but uh, so I met Jack through Phil at that time. Okay. And, and uh, we, and-, and then we started doing stuff together and started hanging and, um, and so I guess he had a gig uh, doing, he got a gig writing, writing the score for village of the giants that and Ron Howard is in that movie. He's a kid in that movie. Um, oh, wow. But so so he you know he asked me to help out and and like co-write songs with him for that movie. And we wrote these kind of not very interesting songs. And the movie was a bizarre kind of you know monster movie. Um, and and then after that he got the gig of do of, of doing a doing the score for the movie Candy that that uh, Brando is in and. Uh, and also, it's the same director. It was the same director as the director of performance. So we did this score, and it was all like you know, getting real loaded and and looking at the screen and and just kind of improvising on on the instruments that we had, you know, uh, Indian Indian instruments and 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 rock and roll stuff. And uh, anyway, that score got rejected, and Dave Brewson wound up doing it. But then he got the gig to do performance, and. So he hired Randy Newman to be the conductor and to do any keyboard playing that was necessary. And he hired me, um, you know, he said, we've got to write a song for this movie. So we got together one afternoon and wrote Gone Dead Train. Right. Wow. And, yeah. And then, and then, right. you know, we went in the studio and started doing it and he had, you know, he was brilliant, Nietzsche. He was, a, he was a great sound person. Uh, you know, he did, he did the score to the exorcist. Uh, um, right. so like all, all the atmospheric stuff he did, you know, it's kind of scary stuff. And he did the same kind of stuff in, in performance, which was before, you know, well before the exorcist. Um, but, uh, uh, so, so we were the core band, me and Rye Cooter and Randy and, and Gene Parsons on drums for the most part. And, uh, Jerry chef and Bobby West on bass on different things. Wow. Um, so, so, and I brought Lowell George in because he was such a great musician, played whatever he played, flute, and I don't know what. Um, so, so, uh, we became real friendly around then. And this is 1969. And, I, and so, you know, friendship with Randy and, and, and Lowell, uh, happened. And Lowell and I were writing songs and he was putting together Little Feet. So I was, friends with Lenny Warnker, who was at Warner Brothers. And, and, uh, and I said to Lowell, let's go over there. You know, he was going to go to a, a small label and I said, let's go to Lenny. So I, uh, I, I took Lowell and Billy Payne over to Lenny's office and there was a little spinet piano and Billy played the piano and Lowell had a guitar and he sang Willem and truck stop girl and one or two other songs. And Lenny looked at me and he said, go upstairs and make a deal with Mo Austin. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even he didn't you even see? hear the band. <laughs> well, it's it's one of my favorite bands of all time. It's uh, yeah, they're a great nice. great band. Yeah, Richie Hayward yeah. and they, you know just phenomenal band. So that was the first album I ever produced, and and that wow. was for Warner Brothers. And then, like a year later, I think um, uh, Randy was playing at the Bitter End in New York, and Lenny said, "Come with me to New York." Uh, you know, we're going to record, we're going to record the show. So I went with him and I think it was only three days or something, but in the middle of the thing, Lenny said, I have to go back to Los Angeles. And he said, stay here in the truck. We, you, you know, we'll co-produce. <laughs> That's how it happened. He That's... had to go here. A foot, he had to go see a, a USC football game. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you should be very, very thankful to the Trojans, right? completely in their debt for the rest of my life. 
Oh, uh, he actually Melody. he said he had planned he had planned it before, but that was his excuse. You know. <laughs> so then we started. Then you know. Then then uh, you know we did that record record together, and then the next thing was sail away. And by then he kept saying, "Why don't you take a job here?" And I kept saying no. And then eventually I said, "Oh, oh, oh all right, I will," because I knew I'd be there. You know, I knew I was just going to stay there anyway. So, right. so, so then we did sail away, and then and then uh, uh, Rye, uh, Rye and Lenny and I did Paradise and Lunch with him. That had to be seventy three or I don't know what it was seventy three or seventy four, seventy three maybe. And then Good Old Boys was next with Brandy, and and uh, and I and I uh, signed uh, Graham, Larry Graham, Graham Central Station to the label, and did their first album. Um, oh, that was I have I have that album. It's a stamp. You know, he's a genius beyond belief. The first time I heard that song here, I thought there were three bass players. <laughs> I thought there uh, no can't question. be one guy doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, he was, <clears throat> excuse me, he was uh, floating. I mean, the, uh, Sly was kind of done at that point, right? And l- l- was Larry touring on his own at that point? or No, no, signing? Larry was still in the band. Larry was still in the band, and there was really, uh, you know, it was it was ugly, I think, real bad blood between them. And, and mm-hmm. so Larry just decided to leave, and he had all of his songs and his demos, which is what I heard when I went up to San Francisco. He played me all his stuff. And it was just so great, you know. So, and he and he put together his own band then, with Chocolate right. and, and uh, Herschel and and, uh, and and Butch Sam and you know Willie Wilde, the drummer. Um, yes. And it, you know it was great. It, it was just thrilling. I went to see him live. You know, it was thrilling. Um, Did you cut that up uh, up in San Francisco? Yes, most of it was done up there. A little bit of it was done at Amigo, but but mainly it was up there at uh, at the record, record plant, plant and at right. at uh, at Wally Hyder. A couple of things were done there as well. Right. Yeah. Oh, that was just great. So so then, all right. So that that was, but you know, that was uh, not your normal, you know, uh, love kind of, you know, pop song with Larry. So. You, no, it's like you change soul music, you know, you know deep R and B soul yeah. record, and uh, yeah. you know, in the in the sly area. But he had his own thing, you know. It's just so so exciting and so you know nasty and great. Um, so so soon after that, uh, soon after that, James Taylor called Lenny Warnker. This is nineteen the end of nineteen seventy four. His you know, uh, uh, he he loved Cooter and he loved the Newman records, and thought that it would be good if if uh, Lenny and I worked with him. So Lenny went to New York and talked to him, came back and said to me, "Now you go, you know, you go meet him now." So I flew back. It was around Christmas time, uh, uh, seventy four, and I met him. And you know, you, it's like love at first sight. He's just such a beautiful guy, and. Yeah. So, he, you know, he played the songs that he had, Mexico and some of the others. He didn't have all of them, but he had most of it. And I went back and, and we decided to do it. So then February of the next, uh, of, of 75, we went into Amigo for two and a half months and made that record. We went in every day, you know, took mm-hmm. the weekends off, you know. It was it was fantastic. You know, he seems to be, I mean, I've worked with him live, uh, you know, a few times with, you know, the Academy Awards and things. He is the nicest cat ever. I mean, what a pleasure it must have been to produce him. Yeah, and funny, like really, like, you know, like Randy kind of funny, only different. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So we had a lot of fun doing that. Lenny and I had a lot of fun. You know, and Sanborn's first appearance on a pop record. Um, wow! On how sweet it is, and and you make it easy. Yeah, yeah. Right, and you you, you used um, that was uh, uh, Russ and Leland and um, uh, that that and 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 Cooch, right? Yes, and Andy and Willie, Andy Newmark and Willie Weeks were on some of that record too. Oh, um, that's right. Yeah, 
And how sweet it is. Keltner's playing on that, so double drums on that one. Um, uh. And Clarence McDonald. I brought in Clarence McDonald um, to play on it. So it's got R&B piano on it. You know, it's got the, it's the article. Right. And, uh, right. yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. so then, you know, did you continue to produce James after that? We did one other record the, the the next year at the same time, you know, February and March. Now we did In the Pocket. It's kind of like one record. The two of them are, are of a piece, you know. And so we did those, and then in 2001, I worked with him again, and I produced his October Road album. Mm. Yeah. That's a beautiful album. Yeah. So then, what happened so then, after that? Yeah. How, how did so, you now get yes, now? Warner Warner's was on fire at that point, anyway. Yeah, you know, Ted Templeman you know, was doing the Doobie Brothers records, and I guess Van Halen, and and uh, you know, Lenny Warnker was made all of those unbelievably great Gordon Lightfoot records, and he did the Maria Muldar record, and. You know, and he was always Randy's producer, so I was co-producer for for you know, however long, like ten years. You know, so we did the Sail Away and Good Old Boys and Little Criminals and Trouble in Paradise and Born Again and you know the Ragtime soundtrack and all all those things. Yeah, right, right. So um, so after after we did those after we did the the Taylor records, so that's seventy six. Um, I got a call uh, from George Harrison and wound up going to England to produce his record, which was self-titled uh, George Harrison. This beautiful record. I took Andy Newmark and Willie Weeks and Neil Larson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who was in nice. the Greg Allman band. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah. And, and we did that record it had blow away on it and love comes to everyone. And it's a beautiful song called your love is forever. Uh, which right. his demo was just the guitar part. And I heard it and I said to him, I said, you have to finish this. You have to write a lyric for this. This is too, you know, this is so beautiful. It's like one of the best things we've got. So, he, so he did, he, you know, he finished it. And I also said to him, why don't you write a song about Olivia? He was going to Hawaii. I said, you know, we don't have a love song, write a song about Olivia. And he came back with this song called dark, sweet lady. And we cut it mm. in LA. You know, I called Gail Avance, so there's harp on it. He played acoustic right. guitar, a gut string guitar, and it's a fantastic part, you know. And uh, and Emil Richards was playing marimba, and, you know, it was great. It was a great little thing. And I think Willie, uh, Willie Weeks on bass, I think. Yeah. I love Willie. So, so yeah, when 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 you associated and and then became George's producer in in this stage at at that career, I mean, he was yeah. accessible and and extremely you know, almost humbling, right? With you? Yeah. He, you know, he, he even said, he said, you know, oh, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not really, not really great at this. Something like, you know, I know how to put the bits together. He said, I'm thinking, what is he out of his mind? You know, <laughs> it's like these great records he made. And, and the stuff, the stuff we did together on that record is fantastic. You know, Winwood yeah, came in and played on stuff and sang with him and, Eric Clapton's on one little part of it, and, you know. Yeah, that's a beautiful record, man. Um, oh, thank you. I mean, so I mean, it's like you know, he's such a you know th this high icon of you know of the world's greatest band of all time, and you know, and and it's just it's it's a great story that you came in at this point, in you know, in, yeah. in his career. Yeah, it was something. And I was there for like two and a half months, and it happened, you know, kind of living in the house and. Yeah. Yep. Well, we'll probably we'll probably leave some of those stories out, but uh, and you know, unless, unless you want to <laughs> want to share one, I'll tell you after the show. Uh, uh, does he brush his teeth? I mean, did he brush his teeth normally? I mean, you know, no, I'm just kidding, of course. <laughs> I think so. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So after that, you know, I came home, and. Uh, while I was there, Lenny Warnker sent me a sent me a cassette, and he said, "There's a girl here in Los Angeles, who's who's got, you know, there's a buzz on her, and you should listen to this cassette, and it's probably something we should do together." So he sent me this cassette. It was Ricky Lee Jones, 
So mm-hmm. there were the demos of Chucky's in Love and Young Blood and Danny's All Star Joint and Company, this beautiful song. You know, I heard Company, I went absolutely crazy. I thought, oh, she's like she she's as good a singer as Roberta Flack, and 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 different and you know more more raw in a way, you know. And mm. so as soon as I came back from that record, uh, we had a meeting, Lenny and, and Ricky and I had a meeting. And and then we soon after that, we went in the studio and started to work on her first record. That record uh, turned the, the industry upside down. It certainly did. Yeah. And I remember yeah. when we finished it, I said to Lenny, and because we had that beautiful photograph, too. Norman Seif took that photograph and I looked at it, you know, we all looked at it and we went, Oh, that's the one, you know, there were all these photos spread out on the floor. We went, that's, that was obviously the one, you know? So when we got done with the record, I called Lenny and I said, you know, I have a feeling that there are going to be a bunch of teenage girls with, with berets and, and uh, Nat Sherman cigarettes yeah. you know, <laughs> running around. <laughs> oh, I was- it, it, it was it was a classic, and of course, you know, all of us drummers, you know, idolized what Gad did on that record. Yeah, it was amazing, wasn't it? Oh, the crazy Phil know. and the crazy Phil and Chucky's in love. Yeah, I know, and 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 um, you know, how, how dare you as a producer allow him to do a fill like that? I'm I'm of course joking. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, you know, cut, cut to higher love, but ne- nevertheless, that's a whole other, a whole other ball game. <laughs> yeah, we, we yeah, will, get, we will yeah. get into that. Um, yeah. so, so, so Lenny and uh, I we're... wound up doing Lenny and I wound up doing that record and Pirate after it. Oh, yeah. right. All right. Well, yeah, listen, we're coming have... up to our. I'm, okay. I'm sorry, Russ, to interrupt you. We're coming up to our second break, and uh, when we come back, we'll have more stories uh, from Russ Tottenham about Ricky Lee Jones. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear, host of Sound Experience here on Intertalk Radio. And Source Connect by Source Element is the essential tool that we use to link between my studio in Austin, Texas, and the WS radio station in San Diego. Now, with Source Connect, not only can we communicate in real time and with HD audio, but it's synced up and is of a high enough quality that I can use it for real time ADR work, remote recording, and overdubbing, and it even allows me to remotely control a DAW. Source Connect by Source Element, affordable, high quality audio and video connection over the internet for all of your production needs. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Girls are talking rock again. And people are listening. Today we're talking bands. Let's talk promotion. Red Giant promo, graphics, EPKs, video, photos, social media, and brand building using content marketing. But let's talk studio at CCMA, which is events, rehearsal, tour prep, piano, guitar, voice, rock band, lessons, workshops, and clinics. Yeah. Bulls, proud sponsors of Girls Talk Rock. Well, get the lowdown on these services and contact me, Tracy, at girlstalkrock.com. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com
Speaking of great guitar players, that's the world's greatest guitar player, Eric Clapton. We are uh, back with uh, Russ Tatterman, and we were kind of talking during the break about a session that uh, Russ called me on for George Benson, and uh, it was for the album uh, 2020, and the song was Beyond the Sea. You want to tell yeah. everybody kind of how that went down? Yeah, I will. Uh, let me let me give you a little background on it. Um, Quincy was producing Frank Sinatra and invited me to one of the sessions. And so, you know, it, it, we, there were like, you know, folding chairs lined up against the wall. So I, it was me, Michael Bennett, Michael Jackson, a bunch of other people. And, and, uh, and so Lionel Hampton in the band, Benson was in the band, Gad was on drums, Ray Brown on bass, just all-star, Brecker Brothers, you know, so he did Teach Me Tonight, Sinatra did Teach Me Tonight, and Beyond the Sea. So I think Beyond the Sea was first. So, so they, do the, they do the track, and then they took a break. And I was thinking, I, and I had already gotten a gig to produce George's next record, 2020. So, so, so they did Beyond the Sea. They did a, a, a Mac the Knife, and my mind immediately went to Beyond the Sea, which was the B-side of the Bobby Darren uh, single, Mac the Knife with Beyond the Sea on the B-side. And so right. we took a break and we were by the coffee machine. And I said, we ought to do Beyond the Sea, I said to George. And he said, I already have an arrangement. I said, what are you talking about? He said, Frank Foster already wrote an arrangement for Beyond the Sea. I said, we're doing it. So, you know, cut to the session where Foster had this beautiful arrangement. He had, you know, he had the band. And uh, and Freddie Green is on rhythm guitar mm. on that record. Right. Yeah. The greatest. So so yeah, man. I mean, it, it, that's why the time got held together as well as it as well as it was. So and that was in New York, anyway, right? Cut the thing, and I took it home and I listened. And I went. The piano is not up to snuff, and the drum is not up to snuff. So I called you, and I called Joe Sample, and flew out to L.A. And we right. went in the studio and overdubbed the drums. And after that, we overdubbed the piano. And uh, and it was quite a task because the track moved around. Right. But as I said during the break, you nailed the thing. It was just amazing. And and George, well, thank you. And George delivered it also. He delivered. What a vocal. I mean, that... and, and the little, even the little guitar solo, though he didn't do much, was so beautiful. Yeah, you know it's an emotional thing, and then and then I called Ralph Burns to write strings on top of what we already had. Right. Yeah. Right. And Ralph worked well, with that, us that... on the on the Rufus and Shaka record uh, uh, on um, "Don't Go to Strangers." That that was Ralph Ralph's arrangement. That's right, and I think that's the Remember first that time. Session? And you had, yep, and you had introduced me to him, and uh, geez, what 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 a legend he is. Yeah. And. <clears throat> I mean, and that and, and that you, leads me into. Mean? That's that's right, and um, yeah. th that leads me into you know you as a producer, um, you know you, you're you're known for your song selection, and uh, maybe surrounding yourself you know with intelligent songwriters, and uh, how, how do you kind of get to that, you know, common ground? You know, I don't I don't know. I mean, it's just love of great songs. And, and, and your, you know, your personal taste, I guess, you know, Quincy does it. A lot of guys do it. You know, it's, it's, it's something deep inside you that, that leads you in the right direction. Like when I got the Benson gig, I flew out to LA to go see Michael Cimbello and I went into his garage and he played the demo that he had of, I just want to hang around you. And like when, when I hit the chorus, I, I was sitting at the board. I turned around, I looked at him and I pointed at him and I said, you have to give me this song. Right. And uh, he, he like, he backed up and he said, okay, all right, you know, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, but I don't know, you know, song selection is just, it's, it's your innate sense of what's right for for the overall project and uh right you know sometimes it's collaborative sometimes the artist really is on it and knows you know if they're not songwriters themselves right you know they have a good sense of who they are you know i mean when lenny and i made uh made gorilla with james 
it was he, he and I were throwing around the ideas of what to do. So I wanted him to do a stubborn kind of fellow, which was Marvin Gaye's first record and it got rejected. And then I said, well, what about you know, how sweet it is? And they went, Oh, that's a good idea. You know? So it was really kind of right. just trying out ideas. Right. And then seeing if, it, if, it, if the, uh, uh, you know, the artist grabs it and, and, uh, and that worked it, obviously very well. Yeah. It, it, you know, perfect because it's not just Marvin, but it's also because he, his favorite singer is Sam Cooke. So it fit right into that pattern. You know, it fit right into yeah. that slot because, you know, he sings kind of Sam like, uh, you know, some of the licks and things like that. There's a sweetness to it, you know. And I wanted a like, you know, an R&B, slight R&B feel to it. You know, let him do something a little different, you know. Right. right. Lenny, too. Lenny, well, same I mean- thing. And when you've you know you've been able to like establish a trust w- with the artist that the artist will respect you, you know, and then all of a sudden you know there are no barriers. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a fundamental thing in in working with a great artist like that. You have to establish trust where anything is okay. Yeah. You know, there's the room to fail, room to room to succeed, room to do whatever. You know, it's it, but it's basic trust. That's right. Wow. Well, I mean, so when when you were younger, obviously, you know, you were mentored by Phil and and uh, and others, uh, you know, and and that's how kind of you learn the st- the stepping stone. How do you today yeah. now mentor the young the young people and you know the youth? Well, it's an interesting question uh, uh, because I, I you know I don't go out that much, so I, I don't I don't meet a lot of new uh, new people, but when I do. Uh, you know, I mean, a lot of a lot of younger cats don't know stuff I've done that much. I think uh, I used to be close with uh, Q-Tip. He was real, right. real knowledgeable about everything, all, all the older stuff. You know, he loved Steely Dan and loved all this different stuff. Uh, so, but you know, you just have to be open, and you have to be open and welcoming and supportive. Right. You know, you have right. to have a, a, and, you know, and, big, you have to have a big heart. You know. Well, that you do, my brother. Um, do you Thank have? You uh, I mean, I know uh, if you were to name, and I, you know, people do this to me too about all these singles I played on. But what are your yeah. three favorite productions? Well, you know, there are quite a few that I really love. I, I you know, they're all my children, as we as we are wont to say. Um, but, but. You know, two of my favorites are are ones that we did together. Ain't Nobody is one of my favorite records that I worked right. on. Higher Love is one of my favorites. Back in the High Life again is one of my favorites. Um, and and Ain't Nobody actually Ain't Nobody is what got me the gig to do the Winwood record because the, his, the Steve's one of Steve's managers said, we, you know, they had this demo of Higher Love, and he said he said. You know, we should get Russ Titleman because he made Ain't Nobody. He's good for this record. And so uh. that's how I got that gig. And I had already worked with Winwood. I made a Christine McVie record, and, and and we were in Switzerland making that record. And she said, let's go see Win- Winwood. So we went up there, and, and he sang on one of her things, and they wrote a song, and we did a track. So we had a good working relationship already. And um, Right. So, but, you know, Ain't Nobody was was a real different kind of experience because we did that record in pieces. Yes. Utterly in pieces. And, and you know, Hawk, had, Hawk played all of the keyboard parts. The only sequence right. was, the, was the thing that opened the record. Everything else was perfectly played by Hawk, even though it sounds like it sequenced. It wasn't. Right. And... You know, Tony did Tony did his guitar stuff, and but when we did the drums, we we copied the 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 pattern that the the the, the machine pattern that he had, and I, right. I I don't know if you changed things here and there, but basically you stuck to that pattern, and we did it in pieces. We did the hi hat first, and then we did the kick and snare, and I think actually, a couple of weeks later, actually. Actually, we did the kick and snare first, and then the hi hat. But that's okay. And then the hi. Oh, you know, I didn't remember <laughs> that, that. I well, didn't remember that. It was that. yeah. So damn difficult. Uh, it, and you, you know, we're, we did that in Amigo. You know. Yeah, I remember. We, we were yeah. in. The, we did those in the in the D studio. 
Yeah, that's like a little teeny room, right? Yeah, you you were in a little teeny room, but the but the you know it was in the D room, which was the new studio that Lee had built. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and so and so um, uh, so 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 yeah, kick and snare first, then the hi hat, then that's uh, right. toms and cymbals. Like later, a week or two later, or, you know, I don't know when it was. That's then. and then yep, we that's added right. we added tim- yeah, and we added timbales at the end, you know. Right, Paulinho. Paulinho. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. That is yeah. right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that, uh, it, 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 it was fantastic. And, uh, uh, you know, that was part of, a, of just a beautiful time, it, it, you know, that, that I was glad that it led into the Winwood situation. But, yeah. Um, and then, and then, and um, then Higher Love was kind of done in, in a very similar way, you know? That's right. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. You, fl- oh, you flew me to New York. Yeah, that was yeah. that was great. Damn right. Um, um, yeah. Real, real. Uh, I'm going to move uh, this uh, segment's kind of blowing by here, but a lot of people don't know that you're a great photographer, and uh, I just want everybody to know that your your work is uh, on uh, James Taylor's October Road and East Village Opera Company and John Pizzarelli's oh. uh, Bossa Nova. Yeah, right? you know, I mean, some of that is just studio stuff, and I, I haven't been shooting for. Uh, for my, I use my phone now, you know. <laughs> I, used to, I used to have a Leica, well, it's, it's you know, good. I used to shoot with a real camera. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's nice, you know. I was, oh, I was and, around and, a lot of really great photographers and, you know, I don't, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if I consider myself a photographer so much as something, it's something that I love, you know. Well, if you, I mean, and that's always, let's say, if you like it, somebody else will like it. Yeah, and, maybe uh, so. Yeah, well, that's the way. That's the way making records is. You know, I figure, well, if I love this thing, somebody's gonna love it. Uh, uh, and you're producing now uh, the, a Holly Cole record. Yeah, I, I just uh, kind of. It's almost done. It's uh, she's a Canadian jazz singer, a really great singer, and we made a kind of a uh, a, a, a swing, you know, ensemble swing record. It's really beautiful, and I made. It, I'm working on a classical piano record with a with a British uh, e- e- young woman named uh, Harriet Stubbs, and it's mm. a fantastic record. <clears throat> and those are uh, yeah. maybe come out this year or, or sometime early next year? I, I think it's early next year that these things will come out, yeah. yeah. Well, listen, in our last little bit, uh, you got advice for the, for the kids. You know, my only advice for the kids is do what you love. And, you know, don't, don't be dissuaded from continuing it. If you believe in what you, what you're doing and you love it, you know, you got to keep doing it. It, it, We we live in a world now where you can't make money making music anymore. Somebody decided music was going to be free. You know, I mean, is your dinner free and that, you know, I, I don't get it, but you know, but, but people still, you know, look, music is the soul of the, of, of the civilization. It's subconscious expression of who we are and what moves us and what communicates to, to around the world. You know, great music communicates to everybody. It doesn't matter where they are, who they are, you know? So, so, I don't know. I say keep doing it. That's all. All right. Listen, you've been listening to great producer Russ Tatterman. This is Vinyl Night, powered by Intertalk Radio, the groove of the music Make industry. You can Night. contact John me at jr at vinylnight.com. Music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists. Using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one-song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? 
marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on InterTalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio, to sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al Dimiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hey, it's Catherine from Listen Local Radio. Moe's Guitars has proudly served the San Diego music community since 1975. Specializing in guitars, basses, mandolins, banjos, and ukuleles, they buy, sell, trade, and consign. If you're looking for lessons, repairs, accessories, and cool gear, you found the right place. Located in downtown La Mesa Village, stop by and check out their digs or visit moesguitars.com or their Facebook page. M-O-Z-E guitars.com. 619-698-1185. Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on InterTalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear.